Hey, thank you for joining us online today. My name is Steve Polk. I'm the executive pastor here at First Baptist Rock Hill. And it's a joy to welcome you to our online broadcast. Today, our pastor is going to bring a very unique message, uh, very timely as we uh, record this and send this out the weekend of July 4. We're going to be talking about religious liberty. He's going to spend some time teaching and also preaching to help us better understand what religious liberty really is to give us a clear understanding and how to apply that terminology into our lives today, both biblically and historically as those things come together as Americans uh, in the church and in our faith. So let's pray together as he comes. Make sure you do grab that notepad and, and copy of God's word and be ready to really lock in with this content. It's gonna be fantastic. So let's pray. God, we thank you for the great nation that we live in, that uh, somehow, however you did it, that you inspired the framers of our constitution, the founders of this nation, to create a document, a living document like the constitution, the Bill of Rights, and, and then ultimately the amendments to, uh, to give life to our relationships, to how we operate in this nation. And the Lord, that they even sought first to provide uh, opportunity for religious liberty and how that applies to us and how it applies to others in our culture. So Lord, help us learn today. Help us take your word and apply it. Help us understand the history of our nation and, and how these documents came together and how it all works together for us to be able to worship you, glorify you, honor you, and tell others about you in every day-to-day -day encounter that we experience. Thank you for our time today. In Jesus' name, amen. As we celebrate Independence Day this weekend, I want to ask you a question. What is religious liberty? What is religious liberty? It seems in our country today there's a lot of confusion and controversy about religious liberty. In recent years there's been controversy uh, regarding uh, Christian bakers or photographers or florists and whether or not they can be forced to use their creative ability in a gay wedding, for example. Recently, the Supreme Court has issued two rulings that deal with religious liberty that have been controversial. One of those dealt with a high school football coach who was praying at midfield following football games. And, uh, and the court said the school district was wrong to fire him for doing that. Another ruling had, uh, had to do with the state of Maine. There was a, a program that the government in Maine uh, enacted to uh, provide tu tuition assistance through vouchers to families who did not live near public schools. So those, you know, very rural area. So those parents could send their kids to private schools. And so the government would help subsidize the tuition for those students. But they said they could not use that voucher for a religiously affiliated private school. And, and uh, so some parents sued and that reached the Supreme Court court and in a 6-3 decision two weeks ago, the court said that the state of Maine's law was unconstitutional because it made that tuition assistance available to all students attending private schools, but it discriminated against those attending religious schools, and that was, that was unconstitutional. It was wrong. And some of the critics have said that ruling by the Supreme Court is destroying the idea of separation of church and state. And uh, I saw a lot of comments on Twitter where people were just going crazy over that ruling, saying my tax dollars are now being used to subsidize or pay for religious education, religious training. So what do you think? What is your opinion? And why do you have that opinion? Why do you think what you think about this issue? And how does this ruling of the Supreme Court, for instance, apply to Muslim schools or Jewish schools? And does it really hurt the idea of separation of church and state? Well, I'm going to come back to this case uh, that the Supreme Court ruled on in the state of Maine. I'm going to come back to that in a few moments and, and answer those questions. But I want to take some time to begin in the beginning to look at some history as well as Bible verses to help us better understand this Issue. In today's message on religious liberty, we're going to look at the history of how we got religious liberty. What does it really mean? 
And what's the biblical basis or foundation for religious liberty? And how do we apply it to the issues of today in the cases the court is facing? So let's begin by looking at the battle in history, if you will, for religious liberty. Because historically, religious liberty is a relative, relatively new Experience. Ancient societies were mostly polytheistic, meaning they worshipped many gods, and yet they also had very specific religions, very specific deities, that even though you worshipped all these other gods, you still had to pay homage to this one religion or this one god. For instance, in the Roman Empire, you could worship any god, have all the religions you wanted, but there were many times when the Romans said you needed to pay homage to the Roman emperor, to Caesar, as God. And if you did not observe paying homage to Caesar, you could suffer. You could be persecuted. And, and that's the reason that Christians in the early centuries were often persecuted by the Romans because they would not worship Caesar. Even though the Romans didn't care about all these other religions, you still had to worship Caesar, this one God, this one religion. In fact, the Romans called Christians atheists because they denied the deity of the Roman Caesar and only believed there was one God. So ironically, Christians were called atheists. And, uh, and so they were persecuted by the Romans. And you, you think in history about the spread of religion by the sword. For instance, Muhammad spread Islam via conquest. For the first three centuries, the Romans from time to time persecuted the church and persecuted Christians. But after Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, the Romans at times expanded Christianity via conquest on the continent of Europe for centuries. The Catholic Church and the nations of that continent and their governments were very closely connected and citizens were taxed to support the Catholic Church in Europe. And, and there were other, other restrictions and other pressures placed on people. During the time of the Reformation in the 1400s and the 1500s, Christian groups started breaking away from Catholicism and, and out of that grew the, the, the Lutherans and the Calvinists or the Presbyterians and eventually the Anglicans and so on. But just about all of these groups and the nations where they dominated formed what we call state churches or official churches that, that had the endorsement of and the support of that particular state, of that particular nation. For instance, in Germany, it was the Lutheran Church. In England, it was the Anglican Church. In various other places in Europe, it was the Catholic Church or the Calvinist or Presbyterian Church. And in the 14, 15, 16, 1700 hundreds, it wasn't unusual for citizens to be taxed to support that official state church. And other groups were suppressed. Other Christian groups, other religions were suppressed. At times, violently suppressed by both the government and the official or state religion of that particular nation. It was in that setting when groups like the Anabaptists and Quakers and Mennonites and Baptists started appearing in the 15 and 1600s and, and they were usually persecuted yet they fought for religious liberty, for religious freedom. Baptists emerged in the early 1600s in the nation of England as separatists from the Anglican church. And the Anglican church and the, the government persecuted these early Baptists. You think about colonial America. Uh, we talk about the Puritans coming to America for religious freedom, and that is true, and it's not true. You see, the Puritans were originally part of the Anglican church, and they wanted to purify it from within. That's why they become, were, were called Puritans. But in time, they gave up and said the church won't change. So they pulled out, and many of them were called separatists. Out of that is what came to be Baptists. And then other groups, Puritans, came to America because they wanted to be in a place where they were free to worship the way they wanted to worship without the Anglican church or the government of England persecuting them. And so they came to America. The problem was the freedom they wanted for themselves, they did not extend to others who worshiped differently than they did. In the original 13 colonies in America, most of them had an official state-sponsored denomination, state-sponsored church. And those who did not had churches they favored. 
And, and, and in some of those colonies, taxes were collected from all the citizens to support the clergy of those state-sponsored churches. And some of those colonies, if you were not a member of the state-sponsored denomination or church, you could not hold public office. And some you could not vote, for instance, in South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and New York. The Anglican Church, today known as the Episcopal Church, was the state-sponsored church. And uh, in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire, it was the Congregational Church, which was an offshoot of the Puritans, if you will. Baptists and Quakers and other groups very consistently resisted all of these state-sponsored churches and the idea of the government having a denomination or a church that it favored and supported above all others. And, and most people don't know this, historians do, but the truth is that Baptists were at the forefront of the fight of the battle for religious liberty in the colonies and in American history. And they were often persecuted. Example of that in, in, in the colony and then the state of Virginia, Baptist preachers. Now listen to this. Baptist preachers had to get a license from the state government in order to preach. And those licenses were hard to get. And the truth is most Baptist preachers refused to apply for one because they believed that the government had no authority to say who could or could not preach. Baptist preachers in Virginia and North Carolina for a long time were not allowed to officiate weddings. They were fined and thrown in jail and some of them were severely beaten. In the colony of Massachusetts, one, one town on one occasion had 18 Baptists in jail for refusing to pay the state tax used to support the congregational church. And if they refused to pay it, their property would be seized and then sold to pay the tax. A man named Obadiah Holmes was a Baptist preacher in Boston and he was put in jail for preaching. He was taken to the public square and he was beaten with 30 lashes from a whip that had three prongs on the end of it. So think of that, 90, 30 lashes times three, 90 wounds upon his body because he was preaching Baptist doctrine and Baptist theology. Of those 13 colonies, Pennsylvania, formed by the Quakers, and Rhode Island, founded by Roger Williams at that time of Baptist, were the only two colonies that really allowed religious liberty. Now gradually, over a long period of time, religious liberty came to all of America. A turning point, a key moment in history was in 1791. Now remember, the American Revolution, the Declaration of Independence, 1776. So 15 years after the revolution began, in 1791, when, when, the, uh, the, uh, when, when the, the Constitution of this country and the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, were finally adopted, did we finally have something legally declaring in the country religious liberty? And those first 10 Amendments to the Constitution are interwoven. They, they support one another. They work together. They all matter. The First Amendment is first because everything else hinges on that one. And let me just remind us this morning of what the First Amendment to the Constitution that was adopted in 1791 actually says. And you can see the words <clears throat> on your screen right now. It says this, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. You see, after the Revolutionary War, we didn't have a constitution and the country needed one. So there was a constitutional convention called for that, that had 55 representatives from the 13 original colonies, and, and, and now they were states, and they met, they met in Philadelphia to draft a constitution for this new nation. James Madison is known as the father of the Bill of Rights, the father of those first 10 amendments to our constitution. 
In Virginia today, there is a small park called the Leland Madison Park where just before that, 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 that convention that drafted the Constitution and the bills of, bill, bill, bill of Rights, a, a popular Baptist preacher named John Leland and the famous James Madison met, and they, they came to an agreement. They made a, a bargain there. This Baptist preacher, John Leland, agreed with Madison that he would not run against Madison to be a delegate to the, to the convention to draft the Constitution if Madison would promise, if Madison would agree to support, if he would promise to seek guarantees of religious liberty. Because before the First Amendment, there, were, there was not a, a guarantee of religious liberty in America. Madison agreed to it. Two years later, James Madison, one of the founding fathers, wrote the first 16 words of the First Amendment. Those words, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or, just as important, prohibiting the free exercise thereof. <clears throat> now, why? Why was religious liberty so important to Baptists? Was it because we had been persecuted for so long? Yes, that was part of it. But more importantly was the Bible. Religious liberty, we believe, is central to Christian doctrine, to Christian theology. Religious liberty is central to the teaching of Scripture. It is central to how God created humanity. Go ahead and be opening your Bible to Romans 14, and while you're doing that, let me just remind us of Genesis 1.27, where the Bible says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In other words, God created every human being in his own image, meaning that we are capable of a relationship with our creator. But let me also call attention to what the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. It says this, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. The Bible tells us a day is coming when every human being that has ever lived will stand face to face with God. And then in the very next verse, verse 12, So then each one, each human being, each person, me, you, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. See, the Bible teaches that not only are all of us created in the image of God and therefore capable of a relationship with God, each and every one of us are going to stand before God, be judged individually and personally by the Lord, and each of us individually and personally are going to give an account of our lives and of our beliefs to God. We're going to answer personally to him. Therefore, we believe the Bible makes it clear that if I have to answer to God for my life, if I have to answer to God for my belief, I must be free to choose for myself what I believe and don't believe, how I live and do not live, that no person and no governmental authority should control my conscience. That's why as Baptists we have always, we have always been firm in our belief that, that there should be no state church, no official church of any state, of any government, of any nation, that people must be free to believe and to practice their religion, to obey their religion. That is the natural outgrowth. Listen, it's the natural outgrowth of being created in God's image and being accountable to God. If I'm accountable to God, I must be free to make that decision for myself. It's also the reason in Baptist life, we believe in local church autonomy. Freedom is, is germane to who we are as Baptist people. If I'm accountable to God, I must be free to choose and not forced to act contrary to my faith. And so 
Just a brief overview of the history of the battle for religious freedom in, in, in America and the, a biblical foundation. But, but as I, I move toward tying all this together, I want to talk about religious liberty in today's context and, and the importance of having a, a balanced, a, a properly balanced understanding and application of religious liberty. And I use the word balance because we have people on two extremes in our culture today, the far left and the far right, who really do not understand religious liberty in its fullest context, who have a tendency to overreact to rulings or decisions by the Supreme Court, and who refuse to, to apply the First Amendment with fairness to everyone. <clears throat> I call your attention to the opening words of the Bill of Rights, the opening words of the very first amendment that James Madison drafted and was approved by the Congress that says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now notice those two phrases. An establishment of religion the idea of a, of a particular religion or denomination that a state or a government favors. And they're prohibiting the free exercise of whatever religion or faith a person chooses, not putting restrictions on their ability to practice their faith. Now, those on the far left have a tendency to focus on the establishment clause. No favored religion. And, and, and they tend to not put as much focus on the free exercise. They'll give it lip service, but they really don't balance it. They don't balance it with the establishment clause. Those on the far right, they sometimes put such an emphasis on the free exercise clause that they don't balance it with the no establishment clause. And, and they're both in the First Amendment because they work together. And the challenge is, and, and the goal is, and what has to happen is we have to let them work together and hold them in balance. One is not more important than the other. Both phrases, both phrases, no establishment and free exercise are critical to not only understanding religious liberty, but to actually practicing religious liberty in a civil society. They must work in balance. And what that means is that the government cannot favor one religion over another religion, cannot favor religion over no religion, and cannot favor no religion over religion or non-religious persons over religious persons. That the government must treat people, whether they are religious or non-religious, the same way, fairly. So let's go back to the beginning of this sermon when I talked about the program in the state of Maine where they provided tuition assent, assistance, if you will, vouchers to families who, whose children did not have access to public education because they were in such rural, remote areas. And, and the state of Maine said, we, we, will pay, we will help you pay tuition to go to a private school because public school is not available. So we'll help pay your tuition to go to a private school unless that private school is a religious school. And the Supreme Court said that law was unconstitutional because the state was making vouchers or assistance available to all families, all parents, all students who otherwise qualified for them and denied it to some solely on the basis of them attending a religious school, the court said you can't do that. You cannot deny publicly available benefits that, that, uh, to, to someone just because of religion. And some people today are going crazy over that decision two weeks ago. But here's what I want you to know. That decision really is not new. It's really not groundbreaking. For instance, in 1947, so we're going back, what is that now, uh, 73 years ago? In 1947, the state of New Jersey had a program <clears throat> in which the state 
reimburse parents the cost of transporting their children to school via buses because they didn't have public buses everywhere. And so if a parent had to pay for their child to ride a bus, whether that child went to a public school or a private school, the state of New Jersey paid, reimbursed the parents to, to, for the cost of having to pay for their kids to get to school. And that included even if they went to a private religious school. Some taxpayers did not like that, and so they sued the state claiming that <clears throat> their taxes were being used to subsidize religious education, if you will, or religious instruction. In 1947, the Supreme Court, by a five to four decision, said the program was constitutional. And the court's reasoning was that the law primarily benefited the parents and the children, the families, and that the subsidies were available to all parents who bust their kids. And since it was a generally available benefit, it wasn't favoring religious groups, it was available to anybody, they could not exclude those who went to a religious school anymore. It's similar to the state providing fire protection and police protection for churches and religious people. And this court said, said what the state was doing was constitutional. 1968, just a little over 50 years ago, the state of New York, the state of New York had a program that required local school boards to provide textbooks at no cost to all kids, all children in public and private schools. Some school boards objected because some of the private schools were religious, primarily Catholic schools, and so they sued. That case reached the Supreme Court, and in 1968, by, by a vote of six to three, the Supreme Court said the program was constitutional. Why? Because the program was not favoring religious students or religious schools. It was available to all students, making textbooks available to all students, wherever they went to school, and they could not single out religious students and religious schools for exclusion. To do so would have been unconstitutional. So the court said in 1968, this was constitutional. More recently, in 1986, the state of Washington, out in the Northwest, had a program to encourage blind people to to receive a college education or maybe attend vocational school. And what the state of Washington would do is provide tuition assistance to help blind students go to college or go to a vocational school. One of those blind students who applied for that tuition assistance was turned down by the state because... He wanted to go into Christian ministry. So the state said no. He sued. It reached the Supreme Court. 1986. And the Supreme Court in a unanimous 9-0 to zero decision said the state of Washington was wrong to, to deny him tuition assistance simply because he wanted to go into Christian ministry. Are you beginning to see a pattern emerge? Just two years ago, 2020, the state of Vermont had a program that uh, paid upper-level high school students to take college courses. It would help them with the cost of taking those college courses. I remember when I was in high school, when I was a senior, I took an English class, a college-level English class to get a head start on college. And so the state of Vermont wanted to encourage that. They were helping pay for the cost of these upper-level high school students to take college courses. And Vermont law included private schools, said that students at private schools could also get that assistance to take college classes unless it was a religious private school. Students at a Catholic high school sued. The appeals court, based on previous rulings of the Supreme Court, said the state of Vermont was violating the Constitution. The state of Vermont was wrong to deny that assistance to students at religious private schools when they made it available to students at other private schools. 
In other words, you can't single them out just because it's a religious school. Now, you can't give preference to them, but neither can you discriminate against them. And so the court's been very clear, and it's not new. It's been this way the whole, the whole time. And so there, there, there are some takeaways. I just want to kind of pull this together and, and summarize. And, and here's some takeaways from, from what I'm saying today. And I know in some ways this has been more of a history lesson than a, a sermon, but, but I think that's needed because in many ways many of us are not very informed historically, and we need to be because it helps us understand issues and keeps us from overreacting or reacting in an inaccurate manner. Some key takeaways. Liberty and freedom applies to everyone or it applies to no one. It applies to people of, who are religious and, and, and all religious, not just some, but all religions. And it applies to people who have no religion, to people who are atheists. Liberty requires free expression of all ideas. We've always maintained that there should be freedom of expression and allow different beliefs and different thoughts and different ideas and different religions to compete in the free marketplace of ideas and people will decide for themselves. And so today with some of the focus on safe spaces and censorship because what you say hurt somebody's feelings, flies in the face of the history of religious liberty and freedom of speech as guaranteed in the First Amendment. Public disagreement and debate is okay. Another takeaway, liberty means that the government, now listen, the government cannot favor the religious over the secular, and government cannot favor the secular over the religious. During the pandemic in our country, some local governments did not keep that in mind, in balance, if you will. They, some, some local governments put overbearing restrictions on religious gatherings that they did not apply to certain secular gatherings. And, and they bent themselves into pretzels, if you will, trying to justify that, but it was wrong and it was unconstitutional and the courts have been clear on that. Now, as Baptists, we must support freedom and religious liberty for everyone, including those with whom we disagree, Muslims, atheists, and so on. As Baptists, we need to remember that we're not trying to build a Christian nation. We are trying to grow the kingdom of God. John Leland, that famous and influential Baptist preacher of the 1700s who cut that deal with James Madison that was, in, that was instrumental in the First Amendment being in our Constitution. John Leland, that Baptist preacher, said this, and I quote, he said, the notion of a Christian commonwealth the notion of a Christian state, of a Christian nation, should be exploded forever. And some of my brothers and sisters on the far right need to hear the words of our Baptist forefathers because we can go too far that direction just as the liberals can go too far in the other direction. And then here's the final takeaway. We need to use religious liberty and freedom as an opportunity for us to be a witness for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, the people of America need Jesus. They really do. Because Jesus brings salvation. Only in Christ is there salvation. And religious liberty means I have the freedom without fear of persecution to stand up in the public arena and say Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him, America needs Christ because without him, the citizens of our country are lost. But the people of our nation need Jesus also if we're going to maintain true freedom and religious liberty. Thomas Jefferson, if you go to Washington, D.C., the Jefferson Memorial, there's a quote inscribed on the Jefferson Memorial, a quote from something he said during his lifetime. Thomas Jefferson said this, Can the liberties of a nation be secure 
if we have removed from the hearts of the people belief that those liberties are the gift of God. What he was saying is that liberty, freedom, is God's gift, and it is. But so is salvation. It's all a gift from God. One of the greatest gifts we have in America is religious liberty. Old brothers and sisters, work to properly understand it and do not allow the extremes on either the right or the left to corrupt your understanding of religious liberty. God gives you the freedom to believe or not believe, to be saved or remain lost. Use your liberty to choose Jesus. Use your liberty to choose Jesus. God bless you and happy Independence Day.